Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we are doing a Q&A on sex with Minister Roger over here. I'm going to let him introduce himself a little bit, tell you what does he do. A pleasant good afternoon, uh, my brother, and good afternoon to your um, audience. And as Brother Ezra said, my name is Roger Ball, and I am the Senior Pastor of Family Worship Center. In fact, I'm at the church right now uh, doing some things. Um, I also serve as an assistant principal in New York City Department of Education, and I uh, pastor this local church for the last 19 years that I started, Family Worship Center, the Church of God of Prophecy, so it's good to be here. As you can see, Brother Roger do so much stuff. He's heavily developed into the youth and really preparing them and educating them because we are the leader of the next generation and the next generation need to be in good hands because they're not going to be here for too long. He's doing his part and I'm doing my part by making this video and try to educate you guys as much as possible. If you have information, don't be selfish with your information and keep it in. You reach it out, give it to people. Whatever you do with a video or you just tell your friends, just educate everybody because you want the people around you to be lifted up, the people around you to be educated. Don't be the only smart person in your group. We're gonna be talking about the topic of sex today. This question we have today for Minister Roger is, in your own words, how does the Bible describe sex slash what is sex for? Well, again, and thank you again for the work that, you, uh, that you're doing. Um, uh, the Bible is clear that, um, that sex, first of all, takes place within the context of relationality. Um, so consider, and so this is not something that we oftentimes talk about, but consider, consider Joseph and Mary, right? Um, consider that relationship. The, the, the New Testament tells us uh, in the opening gospels that Mary was, uh, and Joseph were, were dating in a real sense. They were promised to each other. They were spouse to each other. And during this time, we are told that she was a virgin. And uh, it is critically important for us to think a little bit about that, um, though it didn't say that he was a virgin. And I don't want to go off in a, in a different direction here, but it tells you also about uh, that even in scriptures that um, virginity is prized amongst women or for women, but not necessarily for men. And I think even as a church, we need to upend and uproot and deconstruct some of those um, uh, sexism when it comes on to like a guy who goes around his Mac daddy um, and a girl who does that is a thought or is a, a, a you know um, is is not ideal yeah. so um, uh, so scripture scripture talks a, a lot about um, uh, sex the other thing that I will say is that when it comes on to um, uh, to sex that it it's important for us to really give serious consideration to delaying um, sexual activities. That was a really, a very well um, said answer, and we're going to get straight into question two. Question two is, how does sex and marriage create a spiritual bond between men and women? Good question. To, to, to your question, uh, Robert Sternberg um, talks about, and I'm steep in some of this, issue, this conversation that you're talking about because I'm, I'm literally putting the final touches on my, last, my latest manuscript which is called Deconstructing Love, a book that will be coming out sooner rather than later. And so Robert Sternberg uh, talk about uh, a, a triangular theory of love. And if you imagine a, a triangle, um, Sternberg talks about that there are three components to love. And there are three components to love as we know it in a relationship. So if the question is around uh, sex strengthening relationship, Robert Sternberg talks about the three components to love. So he talks about uh, passion, it talks about uh, commitment, um, intimacy, and then at the base of the triangle, it talks about commitment. So passion, intimacy, and commitment. The idea here is that in terms of bonding, sex in and of itself is not enough to hold the people together. It, it, it has never been. It, it, it can't and it has never been, nor will it ever. And so to anchor this conversation, you always need a little bit more meat on it, if you will. You need to talk about um, what the sex look like without, without intimacy, because sometimes we confuse sex and intimacy together. They're actually very, very different. Um, sex is, a, is an act. Our passion is, is what goes, in, goes into things like attraction and lust, desires, 
um, the person that you're attracted to, the kind of woman that you may be attracted to, um, the way you imagine sex in your head, um, all of that are sex script, we call it. And so all of that falls into the sort of the passion, the first angle of the triangle. And then the second ang angle is that of um, intimacy. And intimacy is this deep sense of connection with somebody else, right? It's this like, I need you, I can't live without you. Like you mean the world to me. Uh, people could have sex without feeling those things. People could have sex without feeling that, right? It's a part of you that makes you want to, um, com makes you want to make sacrifices, may to think about the person, not just in a sexual way, but to really think about the best well-being of this person, to make sacrifices for them and for the relationship. And then at the base of the triangle is commitment. And commitment really is a significant glue. It's, a, it's, a, it's foundational because what it does, it holds the relationship together. It holds the relationship together. For example, think about an elderly couple where sex no longer is the thing that they think about 24 hours, seven days a week. We're, right? they, 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 they've lost their libido for the most part. And what they have left is the intimacy. What they have left is the intimacy and the commitment. And so the commitment says that in all the seasons of our lives, we are together no matter what, right? That is critically important. So sex sits on one part, in intimacy sits on another, and at the base of it is commitment. Question three, why is having sex before marriage such a bad thing? Marriage to begin with is, um, it, the Bible itself describes the church as the bride of Christ, right? The church as the bride of Christ. Um, both in the gospel, in, in, in the letters and in Revelation, that the church is a God, is a body of, it, it, the body is, the, uh, uh, the body of Christ is the bride of Christ. Um, sex without marriage and marriage without commitment is a recipe for disaster. So when Jesus and God, when Christ is committed to the church, it's a commitment that through sin and grace, successes and failures remains in a covenantal space. And so sex without marriage oftentimes is indicative of a relationship that doesn't have commitment and the sacred blessings of scriptures tethered to it. As a result of that, we find all kinds of negative consequences. Take for example, consider this bit of statistics. Consider Brooklyn, the Bronx, the inner cities, uh, communities of New York City. 73% of children that are being born, they're being born out of wedlock. The vast majority of those children, by the time they reach their 10th birthday, they will not have any relationship with their fathers. That is sex outside of marriage. None of the world said answer. You just keep coming with the well said answer. We're going to get straight into question four. Do you know what the consequences are for fornication according to the Bible? Well, there are plenty of scripture that talks about the, the, the pitfalls, some of which I just mentioned in a sociological, in sociological uh, psychological, uh, and human tools. So um, other scriptures, Colossians 3, 5 says, uh, put to death, therefore, whatsoever belongeth to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, purity, lust, evil desires, and greed, uh, which is idolatry. Uh, and so uh, the scripture tells us that uh, there are negative consequences. And I think that as a young uh, leader, you should always situate those consequences in, in, in larger sociological and psychological and theological terms so that it's right. It's uh, connected back to what God intended sex to look, fight, look like, which is why he created Adam and Eve for them to be together, for them to be one flesh, not for multiple fleshes to be uh, you know, roaming about and jumping in and out with each other, but for there to be one sex, for there to be one, um, one flesh where body, hearts, mind, financial resources, dreams, hopes, and aspirations all come together to create a family and a lifelong partnership. Question five. How can having sex after marriage have a positive effect on your relationship? It can and it should, shouldn't it? It can and it should. But I would say that um, in my work on a weekly basis, and I see you know, lots and lots and lots of couples, especially during this pandemic season, but many married couples are starved of sex um, because their relationships are not healthy. So because people are married, don't mean that they're having sex. 
In fact, we know that a lot of people who are married are, uh, you should see the, what the data says about married people and how often they have sex. Some people are having sex a few times a year. Some people are having sex once a month. Some people may have sex just a few times a month. Smaller percentage are having sex uh, several times a week. Um, and there are all kinds of reasons. Number, uh, probably at the top of that list is, is poor relationship. Um, and many marriages also suffer infidelity. So this idea that because people are married, that they're having sex and they, you know, they, 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 you know, they ODing on sex is actually very much not true. It's why this kind of conversation should always be situated in the in a harsh reality that at the foundation you need commitment, you need intimacy, you, and by intimacy, a deep sense of spiritual, moral connection uh, with each other. The easy answer is this, that, right, that if the relationship is healthy, people are going to have more sex. If the relationship is healthy, that sex is one variable that will bind people together, right? That will renew their loyalty, renew their love, renew their, you know, the shared experiences, the shared value, uh, where they procreate, they bring new life into the world, where they reaffirm their love and their bond for each other through sexual intercourse, through touching, through speaking and listening, through resolving conflict, through um, dreaming of a future together, through investing together, through raising children together, through worshiping together. See, it's big, it's inclusive, it's not just that. And to reduce, when we reduce sex to to the conversation, what we have done in some ways, and as harsh as this may sound, is that we, we turn it into an idolatrous thing uh, where it, is, it, is, it, is, it lives in a vacuum outside of all of the other pieces of what it means to be human and what it means to be husband and wife. Okay. And the very last question we have for today is, what is one thing you want the viewers to know about sex relating to the Bible that we did not discuss? One of the important things I would say to young people, my brother, is that, and so this is some of the research that I've been doing um, and looking at the body of literature, to get to know someone, um, and if you're interested in someone and you wanna date someone, the research is clear that once sex is introduced early in that relationship, it muddies the water. It prevents you from really seeing the person as they really are. It prevents you from really getting to know them, getting to know them. Um, it also short circuits the development of true friendship. True friendship should be developed before you begin to engage in sexual activities. And one of the cornerstone of a healthy marriage and a healthy relationship is friendship. All of the research and all of the data from the Gottmans and Sternberg and all of these theorists um, tells, you, tells us that if you're not friends, um, first, then you're going to have some serious problems. And I see that all the time where people live in the same homes and they may have sex, but they're not friends. Um, they're not, they're, they're married, but they're not friends. And sex dwindles significantly for them. So the longer young people can wait to delay sexual activities, find someone that they are in love with, um, get to know them, move the relationship towards uh, marriage, get some significant amount of counseling, uh, learn the language of talking to them about sex because it's such a taboo, even especially in our churches. There's nothing taboo about sex. It's, it's, it's like breathing. It's nothing taboo about it. It's like eating dinner. There's nothing taboo about it. It's like, it's like going you know, to school. There's nothing taboo about it. It's one of the things that we do as human beings and to, to make it a taboo and to make it, to bring shame and guilt into the conversation oftentimes really cause young people to take those behaviors on the ground. And one of the worst thing you could do is take sex on the ground. What usually follows STDs and HIV and immoral behaviors. And so, you know, shed some light on it. Uh, and do what you're doing. Continue to talk about it and situate it not only as a mechanical activity, like, you know, like, you know, like working a piece of machinery, um, but situated in the love of God, in covenant, in deep and meaningful relationship. Um, and when you do that, sex becomes better um, than just having casual sex, better than demonizing it, uh, better than looking at it as a chore, better than looking at it as, as some divine encounter. 
He looked at it as a gift from God to humanity for us to grow and develop and create the next generation. Okay. Thank you so much for all the good answers for us in the question. Rinda, Roger, we thank you so much for just coming in and educating the youth. You guys just keep coming back. I hope that you guys learned from the, something from this. If you know somebody that just needs to hear this video, need to watch this video, please share it to them. And keep coming back for more of these videos because I'm going to keep uploading every single week. Please like, subscribe. Peace.